All right, good evening. Welcome to Legacy Baptist Church online for our evening service. Glad that you're able to join in, and I trust that you all had a great day today. Good afternoon, and after a great service this morning, so glad that you're able to uh, meet once again with us today as we open the Word once again. And this evening, we'll be back in the book of Exodus. Uh, That's where I was last time I did evening service. And if you remember, I had been doing a series on... um, Uh, Joseph uh, towards the end of Genesis, and I transitioned naturally uh, into uh, Exodus. And uh, last time uh, we were in Exodus, I just gave you a little oversight uh, to the beginning of uh, Exodus and kind of where the nation of Israel was, the people of God uh, were, and um, the promises that God had given to Abraham and that that the children of Israel knew that God would fulfill so they're at a point where they're in egypt at this time and joseph has passed away and uh we're trying to see now okay how is god going to fulfill his promise that he gave to abraham to the children of israel so uh we kind of looked at that um in exodus 1 this week we'll be in uh the beginning of exodus 2 and i want to focus in on a few verses here And I really want to focus in on a couple of key points, so we'll look at that this evening. Uh, So if you do have your Bibles, Exodus chapter uh, 2, and we will read verses 1 to 10. Actually, I'll start one verse back. We'll start Exodus uh, 1, verse 22, the last uh, verse of chapter 1, and we'll read to Genesis, or sorry, Exodus 2, verse number 10. The Bible says, And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes. And dabbed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's bank, brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called her the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, And he became her son, and she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. So before we begin this evening, let's open in a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful that we get to uh, set this day aside, Lord, to worship you and focus on you, Lord. And I pray that as your word is open once again, Lord, that we would just uh, tune our hearts to you, Lord, and that we would uh, listen to the message that you have from your word that you encourage us, that you challenge us, and that ultimately, Lord, that you would uh, be glorified. That is all all that is done uh, this evening and through our lives, Lord, as we respond to your message. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, so we, here we are. We just, uh, like I had recapped in Exodus, God promised Abraham to make him a great image. And the the children of Israel are now in Egypt, and you know what? They're prospering. Uh, Joseph was brought into that position by God, and he saved much people alive, as we had studied before. But they weren't in their own land, and they were prospering. But how was God going to uh, give them their own land? How he was gonna? How was he gonna make them a great nation? So uh, Pharaoh is here, and he's seeing these people prosper, and he's not happy about it, and he's oppressing them. And we see that they continue to prosper. And this is where we truly see the wickedness of man uh, being carried out in these uh, uh, verses here. And he, he gets them to secretly try to uh, kill the, the children of Israel, the, all the male children. 
And when the midwives would not do that, uh, the Lord or uh, Pharaoh commanded that they would be the all the male children would be thrown into uh, the river. And that's the that's the place that uh, Moses' parents are bringing their child into this world, this wicked time that they were living in. And I just want to uh, make uh, this um, statement as we begin this, looking at what was happening and how these children were being uh, killed. Abortion is wicked. It's an evil thing, and we see it so prevalent in society. It's at the forefront of politics, and uh, people are fighting for abortion. They're celebrating uh, when uh, abortion activists and pro uh, choice groups get the victories and they're celebrating in the streets. I know Pastor made mention of that, seeing a, I don't remember what country it was, but the way they were celebrating, you would have thought that um, they had won the Super Bowl or they had claimed the greatest victory in all of history over what had happened in their, in their country. And it's a wicked, evil thing. And it's the same thing that we see here in these passages, how wicked it is to just kill innocent children. I read a quote this week, and I had heard it before too, and it says, Abortion is the evil reverse image of the gospel. Instead of I'll die for you, it says you die for me. And there's so much truth to that, and so much when we look and examine the gospel, how opposite and opposing this idea of abortion is. You know, you could look at so many uh, things in the scripture and just the attitude behind the gospel and uh, the message behind the gospel, and it's all... Christ dying for us in our time of need. Romans 5, 6, uh, Paul says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You know, Christ, he died for us when we were absolutely helpless. We were spiritually helpless. And, you know, the Jesus Christ, our Savior, who laid down his life for those who ran from him and opposed him, but we see this idea of abortion where humanity is literally snuffing out the life of the most vulnerable people, the ones that we are supposed to love and the ones that we're supposed to protect. And it's clearly just totally opposite to what the Word of God says. You know, when you speak to pro-choice movement people and that are for abortion, you know, they look at um, unborn babies, and they look at them as something that's expendable. They're just, you know what, we can just write them off. They're nothing. They're not even, they're not even a, a person yet. You know, they consider them just a, a clump of tissue. They have no purpose of life. Um, there's not a place for them in my, in my plan right now. So if you don't fit into my life, then you know what, I can go ahead and kill you. I can murder that child. Or if they have some disability or anything that may limit their chance of quality of life, then that, that's the perfect reason to end their life, which is so wrong and so against the word of God. That's what abortion said. The gospel says is that, you know, all people have value uh, in God. You know, we're all created in the image of God. Uh, Jeremiah 1 verse 5, it says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So we see that with the prophet Jeremiah. Before he was even formed in the belly, God knew him, and he sanctified him. He had set him apart for a work, and he was ordained a prophet unto the nation. He had a purpose, and just like every child, every baby has a purpose, and we're made by God. We see that each of every one of us is fearfully and wonderfully, wonderfully made. We see that in Psalms. You know, God created us for a purpose and a wonderful purpose. And just the fact that no matter what our life is, no matter what limitations we may have, whatever disabilities we may have, whatever we may face in our life, whatever weaknesses we face in our life, the Word of God says that this is when God gets the glory. His light shines through us. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, it says, And he said unto me, this is Paul speaking, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient 
for thee, speaking about uh, God talking to him. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul was saying, in my weakest, in my infirmities, that's when Christ's strength is made perfect perfect in my weakness, and he gets the glory because it's all him. Here's another great example in the New Testament of how God gets the glory through every single life. In John uh, chapter 9, verse 1 to 3, the Bible says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciple asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Jesus said, it, the, This man's life, his, uh, his uh, predicament that he's in, the, this blindness wasn't caused by his sin or his parents, but he has this that the works of God should be made manifest in him. It should be that his life gets the glory of God. And listen, every child... Every child who is in the womb is a masterpiece that is shaped by God. and He was created by him, and they're one, fearfully and wonderfully made. And it's something that's plaguing this world when we see abortion all around the world and people advocating for it. It's murder of children that God has created with a purpose and plan. But this is, this is the day that uh, Jochebed and uh, Amram, that's uh, Moses' parents, that they aren't named here, but they will be named later in Exodus. This is the day that they were living in. This is what, this is what Moses was born into, this Pharaoh who was killing innocent lives. So I just want to break down this passage here in Exodus 2, and we'll look at uh, verses. We'll first focus on the, the first uh, few verses here in uh, Exodus 2. So we see, And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. So here we see Moses' parents, and they were faithful parents. And you know, often we talk about the, the, chapter, the faith chapter in Hebrews 11. We think about all the people that are listed there, there. But you know what? I never really noticed until I was studying this that in the, in the faith chapter, and it does speak about Moses, but in verse 23, it speaks of Moses' parents. They were named in the faith chapter. Hebrews eleven twenty three. the Bible says, But by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. So it is speaking of Moses' parents. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. Because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. You know, this mother and father, they're listed in this hall of faith, not because they did some great work, not because they were a great speaker or because they gave money or because uh, they, they did great miracles. No, they were recognized as heroes of the faith because they were a faithful mother and father. And the verse says, despite the king's commandment, they were not afraid of the king's commandment. And they continued to do what was right according to God. Um, by faith, we as parents, who are parents, need to watch over and protect our children, despite what the world is saying or what the, what the government has to say, which is contrary to the word of God. You know, we have a responsibility to God and what he lays out in his word. We have a great responsibility. And the sad thing is that uh, the world that we're living in, and even in Canada, the laws are changing, and we're close to the point of, of being criminal just for what we teach our children. You know, if we teach our children what God says about marriage and what God says about gender, and there's rules changing and laws changing, and it's affecting uh, the schools that we're sending our children to. I believe it was in um, Alberta where um, there was a bill that was passed where children as young as the age of five, so that would be like sending Simon to a public school, could be invited to join a gay-straight alliance club at their school 
and the, the principal would have no responsibility to notify the parents. So for example, if we sent Simon to a public school and uh, his friends said, hey, come out to a, a special club that we have at lunchtime. He doesn't know what the club is. He goes there and they start teaching him all these different things. He would be a part of that club and the, the school would have no legal obligation to notify us as parents. But if we were to teach him contrary to that, to speak contrary to that, we're close to a point where we are going to be uh, uh, breaking the law to speak against that or to, to try to teach them God made you a certain gender. And rather than encouraging them to seek out their feelings, but saying, no, this is how God made you, we may be soon in a legal battle for having that conversation. But listen, as parents... We are in for a battle, and things I feel like in the last few years are just ramping up, and things will continually get worse. And just like Moses' parents and the, the climate that they were living in, the day that they were living in, they were parents of faith, and they did what they knew God wanted them to do, despite, the king, or despite Pharaoh's commandments. Are we going to be parents of faith? You know, Pharaoh, he, he was a wicked man. He, he tried to beat the Israelites into submission uh, with slavery and trying to make the work harder. And then he tried to uh, kill the offspring in, in secret, but the midwives wouldn't do it. So plan C, it was by drowning the children in the Nile. And things got worse. And um, it started with oppression. Then it started with secretly killing. Then it became public and saying, look, you guys are responsible for throwing these children into the river. And it became a public uh, thing and it involved the people. So we see Moses' parents and they were able to conceive, conceal the child for three months before they had to let him go. And this brave couple, they, they, they feared God more than they feared man. And they were determined that they were going to live by faith. They were going to raise a child by faith. You know, raising children is an act of faith. Do you remember the moment you brought your first child home? I remember bringing Simon home and you're leaving the hospital and you're driving that baby home and you're saying, what in the world? How am I going to do this? How am I going to be a parent? I don't know what to do. You know, you can prepare as much as you want. You'll never feel prepared and you're going to be a parent by faith. You're trusting in the Lord. You know, it's by faith that a husband and wife desire to have a child, and it's by faith that we need to train our children and send them out into the world. You know, this world, this world is against God. They're against the things of God. They're against the people of God. And we look at the past, the people who were against God, it was almost like a private thing. But now it's so in our face. It's in the forefront, and it's involving the common people and those who are blinded by Satan. But listen, that's who we're battling. Ephesians 6, uh, verse 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Listen, we only have so much time with our children before we let them out into the world. Jochebed and Amron, they had Moses for three months. They hid him for three months before they had to send him out and let him go in, uh, uh, into that water. Proverbs 22, 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should good go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs nineteen eighteen, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Listen, we need to redeem the time that we have with our children. Prepare them as they're, re as, as they're ready to face the world and face the attacks of Satan and face what society is throwing at them and raise them up in the word of God and raise them up as parents of faith and showing them the way they ought to live their life. So verse number three, and says, And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's banks. So we see here that she takes this baby and she makes this basket and places it into the river. 
You know, it was something I can't even imagine this mother putting her child. You know, Pharaoh commanded them to cast the children here into the river. And here she is taking her child and placing him into a basket and laying him gently into the river. But she was trusting God by faith. She protected him. She prepared him and put him in a place where she knew that he would be protected and trusted God by faith that he would take care of him. And listen, we need to protect our children today. We need to prepare our children today. You know, we need to be training our children. We need to be uh, instilling values into them, what is right and what is wrong according to the word of God. You know, just speaking about the climate that we're living in today and just the things that I find Simon growing up in that we didn't have to deal with and trying to figure out, listen, how are we going to prepare Simon for this? But it's simple. We teach him what the word of God says. He might not understand everything that's going on, but he knows this is what the word of God says. This is what he says about marriage. This is what he says about genders. This is what he says about how we should live our life. This is what he says about how we should treat people. This is what he says and teaching him what the word of God says. And we need to instill that in him. We need to protect him so when he goes out into the world that he is protected and he's trusting in God and we're trusting him to God. And it's one thing to teach him, but it's another thing that we need to be a living example of what we're teaching and preaching to our children. So Moses' mother here, she had faith in giving Moses back to God. You know, just reading how uh, she sent her daughter and her daughter was watching from afar off to see uh, what would happen to Moses, uh, she had faith that he was going to be okay because she would not have sent her daughter to watch if she knew that, okay, they're going to find him and he's going to be slaughtered or killed or uh, eaten by alligators. No, she had faith that God was going to take care of Moses. Listen, we need to be willing to give our children to the Lord, willing to trust them to the Lord, willing to put them in God's hand and say, God, I have faith that you are going to take care of them. You know, she received this gift from the Lord and she turned it back over to the Lord by faith. And, you know, this isn't an uncommon thing. We see it in the scriptures of different people who give their child back to God and as a parent of faith, are we willing to give our child to God and say, God, use them for whatever you have. Use them for your purpose. Use them for your plan and trust in his plan and not your own. Hebrews 11, speaking about the, the hall of faith, uh, one example is Abraham, um, who God had promised him the son and this miracle child, and he calls him to sacrifice the son. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So the son who was supposed to fulfill this promise, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. So Abraham, he knew that this was God's gift. God gave him this child, and yet still he had faith to give him back to God. This verse, what it's saying is he had so much faith that when God said to sacrifice your son, he didn't know that an angel would stop his hand. He was ready to take his only son's life because he knew that, he, that God had the power to raise him up from the dead, and that's what he thought was going to happen. He had the faith to say, God, I will give you my son because I know you can raise him from the dead. In Samuel, we see uh, in 1 Samuel 1, the, the first chapter of uh, Hannah praying for this child, and she pours out her heart to God, and God gives her this child. And she gives him back to the Lord. She said, For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Hannah gave her child back to God. Listen, as a parent of faith today, are you willing to 
put your child in the hands of God and trust him with it. Allow him to do his work in your child's life. You know, we worry about the world that we're living in, but listen, this is the world that God in his timing and his purpose has fearfully and wonderfully made our children for these days. And we don't know God's plan. We don't know his purpose, but we need to trust him with their lives. Just like God put Joseph in that position for that time. Just as God placed Moses in this position at this time. Just as I'm speaking about Nehemiah in the morning services when I preach, God placed Nehemiah in that position for that time. Listen, we live in these days and we worry about these days, but this is the world that God has placed our children in during these times. And we don't know his plan, we don't know his purpose, but we need to trust him with that. Verse number five, and the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river and her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child and behold, the, the babe wept and she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews children. So we see baby Moses, he, he floats down the river and Pharaoh's daughter finds him. And I say this, or looking at this to say, God can use anyone in lies. You know, we talked about abortion and just how people just in their own timing and plan say, well, that's not in my timing. Listen, God can use anyone in someone's life. And God may have prepared someone to care for a child. And we see here that God used Pharaoh's daughter. This could have been anyone else. And they could have found that child and say, look, Someone tried to save this Hebrew child and thrown them into the river and drowned him. But no, God used Pharaoh's daughter and she had compassion on him, even though she knew it was a Hebrew child and she kept him and she, she, uh, she saved him. And God uses her in a great way. So we see uh, God used Pharaoh's daughter. God used uh, Moses' sister. God gave her wisdom in the situation. So uh, Moses' sister Miriam, she sees Pharaoh's daughter uh, pick up the child and she says, Shall I go and call thee a nurse of the Hebrew woman that she made nurse the child for thee? And I like the way she says it. She says it almost in an innocent way. You know, should I go get uh, some nurse? I don't know who it is. No, she knew who she was talking about. And Pharaoh's daughter said, Yes, go and get the child's mother. She says, Go get the child's mother. And that was Miriam's plan all along. And she went and got her mom. And how great it is that as she gave, she let, by faith, Moses go. God just says, look, you can trust me. And shows her in a great way that he, I am in control. And now it goes from hiding him for three months. Could you imagine trying to hide a newborn for three months? Crying and, and being fussy, things like that. She goes from hiding him, being scared, to now where she's being paid wages to nurse and take care of her own child until he is able to go and live in Pharaoh's uh, palace. What an amazing thing that God was able to just show and clarify to her, I'm in control. And listen, sometimes God waits for us to give to him what matters the most to us only for him to give it right back. You know, he wants to see our heart. He wants to test our faith. He wants to show us that we can trust him. And for us to say, God, you are going to get the glory. It's not about me. It's about you. And so oftentimes, God gives us the desires of our heart, or he changes the desire of our heart. I remember uh, speaking to a young man, and he was so burdened because he, he had given his life over to the sport. But he knew that, it was more than that. He wanted to give his life to God. And I encouraged him. I said, listen, sometimes God wants you to surrender what matters the most, to, to show your faith that you are fully trusting in him. And so oftentimes, he, will, he might give that thing back to you. He might change the desire of your heart. And, and he realized that he gave his life completely to God. And it changed his whole outlook on life. It changed the way he interacted with his youth group and he grew, became a leader in his youth group and he, 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 he helped other uh, uh, fellow students 
uh, get close to God and walk close to God. And it was a great thing because he surrendered what mattered most to him. And God changed the desire of his heart. Sometimes God just wants us to give what matters to us. And sometimes it's a matter of us surrendering our child over to him. You know, sometimes we have this idea of, I have a plan for my child. I want him to do this, this, and this. But is that part of God's plan? We need to be willing. We need to be parents of faith, willing to hand our child over to God and say, God, your will be done. Listen, God always places his people in the right place at the right time. And this is true with Moses' life. This was true in Joseph's life. This was true in Abraham and Isaac's life. This is true in Nehemiah's life. And it's true in our lives. And it's true in our children's lives. This might be the world that we're living in today. And it, it, it hurts our heart. It saddens our heart. But our children were fearfully and wonderfully made. Just like Jeremiah. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee and I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee. What, what have our children been sanctified for, set apart for God says, I am creating them and I have set them apart for this task in life, to fulfill this purpose in their life, to to fulfill this purpose so that I would get the glory in their life. Listen, parents, we have a great responsibility in our lives to be parents of faith. We have a great responsibility in teaching them what the Word of God says. And maybe you're watching today and uh, um, you're looking at this. Let me encourage you with this as well. We all have a purpose in life. And if you would, pray for parents who are trying to raise their child and bring them up and they're trying to redeem the time in preparing their child as they are ready to let them out, go out and face the world. Pray for parents. Pray for children. Pray for the children of our church. Pray for the students uh, in our church that are going to school and trying to be a witness and trying to, to make a difference. Pray for the students at our school who are going to post-secondary that are being bombarded with the world's philosophies. Pray for the parents of, of these young people. Pray for the parents of teens. Pray for all those young people in the church that God would use their heart and that we as parents would trust their lives in His. So I trust that this has been a help to you, been a challenge to you, and that uh, we would all redeem the time. You know, the days that we live in, it, we, it, it's so easy for us to back off and say, look, I, I don't want anything to do with this. This is, this is a bit too much. No, we need to redeem the time as believers today. Just as much as we need to trust our children's lives with the Lord, we need to trust our own lives and give ourselves over to God's purpose and plan and what He has for us and where He has us uh, in this day. So I hope that's been a challenge to you. Uh, so thank you for joining in tonight. I hope that you'll listen to Pastor's podcast Tuesdays and Thursdays and Wednesday night, our Bible study. And as Pastor mentioned this morning, there will be no devotion Saturday. Uh, so don't uh, get up early for that unless you're going to be up already. But there is the podcast and the Bible study this Wednesday, our last one. So I hope you'll join in for that. But take care now. I hope that you will redeem the time this week and that you'd keep uh, the words, the messages that you heard today and apply it to your lives. So take care now. And God bless. We'll see you next time. Bye.